All right, so I think we have a full house. So it's a great pleasure to have Sabrina Pasterski with us today. Sabrina obtained her PhD at Harvard University in uh, 2019. So we are very glad to have her back today. Uh, she's a high energy theorist who joined the perimeter faculty in 2021 after completing a postdoctoral fellowship at the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science. Her research prior to joining perimeter uh, includes discovering infinite dimensional symmetry enhancements of the S matrix, a new observable memory effect in gravity, and a framework for generalizing these features of infrared physics to other uh, theories. So please take it away. Okay, well, at least the first part of the talk is right there. Um, so basically, um, very nice to be back and also lovely to see all the familiar faces because this is a colloquium where like I know the BHI is all interdisciplinary. I still have like the beginning will be like trying to just like set up a program that like Strominger and friends have, have uh, been building up for a while now. And so that might hopefully be familiar to a lot of you guys. Um, but then in the like the, the main kind of body of the, of the talk is going to be about a paper with my lovely postdoc who happens to be in town today and Grey Hugh. So you can talk to her about that too. Um, great. Okay, so Celestial Holography, just this lovely cool program that lots of lots of people have been a part of. Um, my goal here is to talk about a particular uh, kind of venture where we're trying to tie together this cool research program, which I'll set up in the first part of the talk, and um, other cool research programs within high energy theory. So let's just go back to the basics about why we're doing what we're doing. So our starting point is in some sense the holographic principle, um, which came out of the study of like black hole thermodynamics and Hawking's uh, work. And so basically, if we wanted to try to see that quantum gravity should be holographic, um, there's many, like maybe a couple decades now of interesting work following from Malvasena's conjecture that this ADS-CFT correspondence can really be realized um, from like top down from string theory. And so you have a notion of thinking that this quantum theory of gravity in some curved space time is dual to or equivalent to some conformal field theory living on the boundary of the space time. And this is an explicit realization of uh, actually having the uh, gravitational theory being coded in lower dimensional theory without gravity that you have from an explicit construction in ADS CFT. But we want to basically think about how would we, if we didn't know what string theory is going to land on an explicit duality between um, ADS and some CFT on the boundary, you could instead work from the bottom up. And so this notion of starting from uh, this, assuming that there will be a bulk and boundary duality, but starting from the symmetries and building up from there is something that you're able to generalize to more physically relevant space times. And so the point of the celestial holography program is to find some duality for asymptotically flat space times. And so by doing that, basically, we're going to start from uh, the, the picture that's bottom up. And then hopefully our friends uh, in medical physics and then eventually us too will have some explicit top-down constructions. And so that's kind of the goal. So now that I've motivated the ADSC theory correspondence a little bit, and now the fact that I want to go to flat, that's what we'll start to do. So at the beginning of my PhD, I had the, the uh, fortunate timing of being here in the Strominger group uh, when there was a lot of cool uh, stuff happening, looking at just low energy limits of scattering. And so basically, this program that I'm, we're going to call celestial holography came out of attempts to try to understand how to apply the holographic principle to asymptotically flat space times, focusing on this bottom up approach where you want to match what the symmetries are in the bulk and the boundary. And so, beautifully, each of these kind of aspects of, of the correspondence were studied a long time ago in the 60s. And so, Bondi, Vandenberg, Metzner, and Sachs were trying to basically, I guess, find Poincare in some class of metrics that had zero cosmological constant, but non-trivial matter, stress tensors, et cetera. And instead they found a much larger symmetry group. And um, kind of maybe in 2014, 2013, 2014 timeframe, there's a lot of fun excitement, understanding that those asymptotic symmetries were equivalent to Weinberg soft theorem, also studied in the sixties and certain memory effects that were studied at various times. So like the gravitational ones, I guess it's like in like eighties or so, seventies and eighties. Uh, and now there's more and more examples. So it's a very exciting time at Harvard. Um, maybe 
eight years ago or so, where basically there's this universal pattern of things coming from trying to start from the bottom up, start from symmetries of these asymptotically flat space times, and see what you could get from that, what you could learn. And so roughly there, um, we had some fun um, kind of results already without talking about sociography yet. And I put a spattering them on the board. So basically at the time, the point was that there were an infinite number of symmetries. And I think Hawking came here and was visiting Herbert because of trying to impose those symmetries as constraints and scattering uh, in the presence of a horizon. And then you can go into the questions about confirmation paradox, questions of whether or not there's a firewall. Uh, there was also cool papers by like Riccario, Caput, who's here, and, and Strominger. I really believe those are like it could be about other authors too, and, and Pete, um, trying to reinterpret these IR divergences. Um, and so that's nice because basically, okay, you can say I only want to look at exclusive uh, quantities. Or can I define a, an S matrix that makes sense? And part of the reason why you would normally have this vanishing S matrix when you exponentiate these loop corrections is coming from the fact that you aren't obeying these conservation laws corresponding to symmetries. So there was something very nice there. Further, this framework led to more subleading soft theorems, and eventually, very recently, like this called tower of symmetries, in some sense, is coming from, at least, collinear limits. And um, on this other side, we had a brand new um, memory effect, which is super fun, because they might actually observe spin memory, I think, in five years of like Cosmic Explorer. Um, and I, the people here who do waveform stuff can tell me, that, or we can have fun talking about more like how the utility of that is actually something um, like more practically useful in the sense of trying to merge the analytic computations of waveforms onto the numerics um, uh, for different windows of, of the spiral. So there's that's the fun. And that recently the work of Wald and others, I think has been kind of reviving the story, talking about the consistency of having um, massless Hilbert space. Um, I hope it's just for massive particles. So there's a lot of fun things that kind of came out of this just study of starting from the bottom up and the symmetries of aesthetically five space times. And the thing that I want to focus on is that all of this has a simpler description in terms of this uh, theory living co-dimension too. So instead of the pictograph or whatever, here's the two things I want to say that we learn from that exercise. So first, the fact that five space times exhibit infinite dimensional symmetry enhancements and that these should highly constrain scatterings. So that's going to be basically um, kind of the ethos of the celestial holography program. And the second thing is that these symmetry is naturally organized into those of a co-dimension two theory living in a celestial sphere, and that's the word celestial in the story. So we're studying flat holography, and our starting point is that in the flat limit, there is this set of uh, symmetries that maybe are surprising, and we want to see how far we can push them to tell us about this dual description that we want. Okay. So the celestial holography conjecture is this proposed duality between gravitational scattering and it's typically flat space time and a CFT that's living in a celestial sphere. And so for most of what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about masses theories and in 4D and the 2D celestial sphere, but this should generalize them. Good. Okay, and so what I wanted to, for the subtitle of the talk is talk about the extent to which this is also a collision of research programs. And so I think that like, more practically, you could say that, like, literally, the people working on celestial holography are coming from like crystallography, twisters, and amplitudes, uh, and like quantum gravity, a la like what Luca should talk about later today, corner stuff. Um, and then this whole soft theorem story that I just introduced. But if we try to just take a step back and see why it is that people who care about any of these kind of research disciplines should want to converge on this thing. So when I say celestial holography, I'm thinking, like, look at the night sky. We believe in the holographic principle. How are we encoding whatever is happening in this bulk that we live in on that boundary? If you were an ADS CFT or, um, or something from it from qubit, the people who do conformal bootstrap are studying what's basically happening on the boundary, often using the duality to, to, um, to kind of guide them. If from qubit, people might be trying to talk about um, what's going on in the bulk or how the quantum information is encoded in different places. And then corner people would be interested in two things, basically looking at some region of a space time and trying to look at the symmetries associated to those causal diamonds. And that naturally carries over when I want to talk about the flat limit. So people studying photography before could be trying to basically take this picture, take the flat limit and map that to S matrix elements. And so for us, we're basically looking at the flat limit starting here, starting from the symmetries up here, and basically now identifying basic being at the boundary 
with the on-shell momentum. So basically anybody who studies this for the purpose of going to the float limit is essentially trying to go to the same goal. So you have this nice toy place where you have like gravity in a box. You wanna open up the box and cool things happen when you open up, like hopefully not Pandora's box, but that's good. So maybe in words instead of pictures, you could say kind of the different mottos of the programs very crudely, um, mathematical structures that underlie the consistency of scattering, so certain analyticity, like locality and whatnot, giving a consistent S matrix elements is kind of how these people are building up things. But if you understand that you can really take the flat limit, then not only people who are doing conformal bootstrap in this ADS-CFT context should be able to map onto the S matrix too. And so they're just starting from conformal symmetry and the OPE to say something about the space of consistent CFT. And two different types of people coming in, like this quantum gravity perspective, the different qubiters are looking at entanglement in space time versus the thing that was more directly correct uh, connect to what we're doing is people like Laurence and um, I guess covariant phase space methods where they're starting from the symmetries to the Hilbert space. And while I won't have anything to say here, I know that there's a lot of excitement at perimeter from the quantum gravity group about understanding how these two approaches are connected um, in their understanding of edge modes. And instead of looking at Hilbert spaces, looking at the operator algebras. So I know this is something super exciting going forward that I am glad to be around. So, yeah. oh yes, of course. Um, yeah, so on the previous slide, um, can yeah. I interpret what you're saying in yeah. the statement that if we understood sub ADS locality, then we would understand the um, I think that, um, that like Laurent would roughly try to say something like this. So I'm not saying, it's like, this is why I love being a perimeter because I feel like perimeter is like, okay, we, we like the BHI relative to this field because we have a math that is very fun. We have Laurent and in, in fun gravity and then um, like fun doesn't stream. Um, but we're also the only interesting thing in a 50 kilometer radius. So like, like everybody's there. Um, but yeah, so I would say that the the stuff, like, so he would be interested instead of going to flat limit, he would be interested in bringing the, the corner inward. And, um, so when you're doing that, I think it's less relevant whether like you're then extending it to like as particular flat space times or ADS. And so I think there's a strong reason to, to think that like that's a good link. Um, and also um, like, like I think he is, he's, he's very enthusiastic about his understanding of what Ed's doing in terms of the edge modes that he's studied from these causal diamonds. So I would I'm say- you what you think. I, I, I think, I believe him. That's my. That's what I think. Because I don't know it well enough about. Like I'm about to hopefully get a like the corner family to sponsor me so that I need to know more about the group. <laughs> uh, like I think that. Okay. So the the reason why I think it. Like, I only understand think about it from the point of view of the full causal diamond because I don't know enough about the finite one. But I do know that a lot of the complaints kind of about um, like at, talking to Ed at IS, I would say um, with this picture is okay. You're matching in and out. And then also the extent to which we want to view like the, the Goldstone modes as canonically paired to these memory modes. And so something about whether or not we should really impose boundary conditions that like kind of kill one of the two. And the like all these complaints about whether or not it's just a gauge symmetry kind of arise in the same spirit about imposing like dear shape boundary conditions, I think on these, these finite causal diamonds. So that's the extent to which I believe it because I know that the complaints, part of the complaint there has been used uh, to at least be skeptical of, of the program that I understand better at infinity. So that's where I believe, like I have a bias to want to believe it, but then I also just, I love the fact that we can connect everything. So I'm going to help, but I don't look at me. <laughs> would help me there. So great. The sign that quantum yeah. stuff, I, I think they're also, I mean, there's one like it funny, yeah. but I think there's also like mathematical things that come up in this that are really identical yeah, to, yeah. to the sub ADS locality. Yeah. Well, yeah, they look like the same. I mean, they yeah, they, I mean, they, I mean they, you could just kind of like try to extend like the like little cause like the. Um, it's, it's, it's the same problem from the other end. Yeah, no, this, and that's why I think it's so beautiful. So like, I, I really wish I could, could say more about what I feel about it because I feel like I don't feel enough about it. I just know that I feel like these fields are colliding and I'm like, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to be a part of it, but I, I can't, I can't say more yet because I, yeah, okay, good. So, okay, so then let's go to the Celestial Dictionary. Okay, so I try to motivate that I really am excited at least, if not, or like you should be excited whether or not we know exactly why, <laughs> um, because I think if you try to brand, you know, you're studying scattering or you're studying holography in a physically relevant, like, you know, more astrophysically relevant space time, whether that's a finite causal diamond or like asymptotically flat to match the S matrix, 
those are both very interesting questions. So like, I don't think anybody can question like that that's something important to study, which I love. Um, and then, so in this talk, I'll talk a little bit about merging things, but I think there's also some exciting directions for just like these papers out of Brussels studying flat limits of, of ADS CFT and like seeing that the flat limit is different uh, makes you realize that these, like, these sets and types of issues should be very important to really understanding what the flat hologram is. And yeah, okay, sorry, but that's an aside. So ignore what I just said right now. We can talk about that over this week. And what I want to focus on in this talk is just setting up uh, a way to kind of um, a proposal to marry two um, highly developed yet somewhat disconnected uh, fields, which will be this celestial geography story and the people who are doing conformal colliders. So, like, this is a rebranding exercise to some extent. Okay, so the first thing for the celestial dictionary we're studying, we're studying scatterings. We're going to prepare our initial and final states by pushing our Cauchy surface up towards the conformal boundary. We're interested in massive scattering. And so, most of those Cauchy surfaces, to some extent, are hugging past and future null infinity. So, this is a double Penrose diagram. I have our past time like infinity, massive particles would enter here, massless excitations enter on the boundary. There's really an S2, but I've shown two parts. That's in South Pole. I go out to either spatial infinity, if I look at the um, boundary of a space like a Cauchy slice, and time like infinity if I go up there. And so basically for massless scattering, I have data on this green and uh, yellow diamonds. Good. So when I'm talking about celestiography, basically, as long as I'm building up, and so this isn't what you want at the end, like the whole, the whole point of a top-down hologram is you know both sides of the duality. And for instance, in ADS-CFT, you have the strong weak duality, so you can learn something about like strongly coupled connected matter systems, which is cool. But say I'm building up the dictionary starting from the book, then nobody should be able to complain about, say, for instance, well defined celestial fees, et cetera, because I know what I'm basically doing. I'm taking some correlation functions that would be the input for my LSD formalism and restricting them to a codimension one null surface, which for the massless guys, I'm really thinking of it as being future null infinity or past null infinity. And then I'm just dimensionally reducing to, because the causal structure of that null surface is such that basically um, distance being x squared is zero means you're at the same point in the celestial sphere, but could be separated any distance along, along the null direction. And so basically when we're building up these celestial operators, we're building up operators that um, if they were local in the celestial sphere, they could be extended along the null direction. And that's going to be um, kind of underlying why maybe the celestial description is a, is a natural one. So this is what we're doing. And depending on which scattering basis you want to look at, you basically are integrating or smearing along the generators in different ways. So for example, you could just not smear it all. And you're looking at scattering in the position basis. And you know, this isn't like when normally when you're talking about the S matrix elements, you're not worried about transforming it back to an impact parameter. But if you do, this is where you start to really understand these subtleties about the phase space and like why. They're like you don't have square integrable um, um, news functions in some sense, because basically what's happening is you know uh, for a given scattering process what the tails are supposed to be at early and late u, and so that was underpinning our understanding not only of like the, the phase space that you need to be considering, but also the identification of asymptotic symmetries, understanding what memory effects you could do, and then also it's easier to just I guess start from the uh, initial data on this Cauchy surface, and then evolve into the book to talk about the relationship between bulk physics and boundary physics, there's a lot of utility to just taking your scattering amplitude and Fourier transformize it. But this still leaves the question of when you're actually talking about phase space, um, why should you include, say, overleading gauge transformations? And so there's a time where there's this delicate balance between, okay, this is my phase space, these are the physical falloffs because I don't want to exclude some interesting process from happening. But depending on what falloffs I consider physical, I have to be careful about, um, like, not like I, or I, either dealing with the constraints that come from um, basically the, the canonical conjugates being unphysical, or I include them both in a certain way. And so there's really a delicate balance between what asymptotic symmetry group I have and what I'm saying about my phase space that I'm allowing. And so in the position space, there's there's all these like subleading soft theorems, and there begs the question: Do I start adding like all these overleading large gauge transformations? I don't know. The nice thing about momentum space is you kind of know the structure of the amplitudes. Um, already. And so basically there you can start to use like the whole point of this IR triangle in my story was that you could show that there were new asymptotic symmetries and new memory effects just from the soft behavior that you can compute in perturbation theory. So that's kind of nice. Um, basically the whole point is, okay, so in position space, that's just a different basis transform compared to in momentum space. 
where I already am talking about the s matrix elements you're building up in Weinberg volume one. So here the question that it doesn't quite answer is how subletting can we go? You really need to either know your theory or um, be careful about what limits, what are limits you're taking in order to try to say that there's this tower of say symmetries in the linear limit. Okay, so what I want to say, the celestial dictionary and like the kind of the, the hardcore or like the particular definition of what a celestial dictionary would be is I'm in a boost basis. But I, I like to say that anybody studying these like flat holograms are still celestial people. Um, so if you go into a boost basis, then literally by the kinematics, you have all of your operators in the boost basis. So this is the transform that's taking you to the boost basis. I could also write it in the position space as another slightly different um, integral curl here. Two primaries of the Lorenz curve. Yeah, exactly. So this, uh, this seems like similar to, I guess, um, how when Penrose like studies the uh, like transformations on the light cone, yeah, like, so the light has a celestial sphere. Yeah. So there's a boost basis, like the or the boost of transformations that. I guess map or mix points on the celestial sphere, but then this is a basis, or is this basis corresponding to like the equivalent of boost would act on the celestial sphere? So, so this celestial sphere is the same one in Penrose's story. Yeah. Um, the fact, like, I guess a tool can, and I can try to debate whether the natural thing is like these integer bases <laughs> from like certain constructions of twisted thing, but for me, I, so the sphere is the same. I'm not worried about any sort of twist or constriction or whatnot. I am just literally taking, um, effectively like the, the so if, if say, if say I'm looking at the free wave equation, I'm looking at that as a wave function in the bulk. If I know the data on that Cauchy surface, then I've specified that solution. And I'm just basically writing the data on that Cauchy surface in terms of a delta instead of an omega or a u. Um, so I'm just trading out the energy scale for a continuous value of the global dimension, but the direction uh, on the night sky happens to be the same as where the momentum is going to head towards because of this kind of accident of going to large R in a saddle point. I don't think I don't know if that quite answers your question. Well, but the celestial sphere is the same. I guess I was curious about it's more of like uh, the, the question I was asking: Is the Lorentz group on the celestial sphere the same as the Lorentz group on the light form? That's what I was asking. Absolutely. Okay. So the basic, <laughs> um, you should think of it. Sorry, I don't have the the drawing or board maybe, but. Um, the way you want to think of it is basically if I do a boost, I preserve light cone of the origin and also light cone of spatial infinity, which is like kind of like the opposite point on this Einstein cylinder if I'm looking at the line of the cone of the So um, yeah, you should be able to view it. Like when you look at the night sky, you look effectively that celestial sphere is the intersection of those two light cones. And so your little Millennium Falcon or Millennium sorry, Cessna Falcon, whatever, um, would see this kind of dilation of the points in the celestial sphere. And basically what I'm doing is diagonalizing the Riddler energy as opposed to the uh, usual translation energy in the boost basis. So the fact that I'm doing this is just a basis transformation. And so this, if anything, this is where, um, are you just changing the scattering basis? You're just gonna be like, okay. there's, like, there's a little bit of angst from that, but okay, you can do this. The point is, is that you can't tell me that there isn't some 2D CFD because it's just kinematics. I can do this. So then why would I do this? Okay, so why do we do this? We change our basis because when we're in this boost basis, it points out to us basically a, a whole tower of interesting currents that we can study. Okay, and so the main uh, part of the stuff is going to evolve around basically two different derivations of these holographic symmetry algebras, which came out of the Harvard group. There's the one derivation, which is the holomorphic collinear limits derivation that I'm going to overview, and then there's the Laurent and all version, which is starting from the gravitational phase space, and they're complementary to each other in a way that I think is particularly like satisfying. And this route is going to land us directly on something that I can kind of compare more readily to the spectrum collider literature. So that's why we're talking about it. But just to point out, there's basically a lot of other approaches to understanding this holographic symmetry algebra. And this is what's fun about having a large group of people with different backgrounds working on the same problem like the BHI does, but um, the CHI, okay, <laughs> and self-dual gravity, um, twisted holography, and uh, people who are studying the whole things like Guevara um, coming from amplitude. Okay, so now I'm going to review something that the Harvard group derives, so hopefully be kind. Okay, <laughs> so first of all, we're going to talk about the uh, getting the holographic symmetry algebras from the splitting functions and complexified collinear singularities of tree level amplitudes. Um, okay, so basically, uh, starting from I think like Guevara and then Slope Payton again, working at the linear splitting functions and uh, Himwich and 
and Andy, of course, uh, lots of names. I'm probably going to drop a couple of guys students in there. But basically, you're starting from the amplitude. You're starting from a tree level amplitude. You're taking um, particles collinear. You know, the tree level amplitude basically just has poles where they're propagators. And from this splitting function, you can extract what would be an OPE. And so from the point of view of this extrapolate dictionary, sure. If I take operators near each other on just on this lesbosphere, that's a collinear limit of scattering. So the fact that basically the collinear limits of the celestial story are related to um, collinear limits both in the, in the bulk space time operators approaching each other in the conformal boundary or collinear limits of scattering amplitudes just comes from different this dimensional reduction of, of null infinity. But it makes sense if I really did have a 2D CFT and I'm going to say, let's say I really do have a 2D CFT, then if I take two operators close, that's encoded in the collinear limits of the X-matrix element that I'm transforming to get to it. So I'm applying that integral transform <clears throat> here. And then I get this collinear limits of the function of the weights. Beautifully enough, if I then look at where those gamma functions have poles, I can extract um, the collinear limits of the residues. And so just to keep in mind these holomorphic collinear singularities, it's not so much a soft limit as it is like the leading collinear singularity. So it comes from when I get the propagator touching through another external leg. And then the thing to keep in mind when I'm writing down um, this tower of integer weights is that roughly I'm at either spin plus or minus two. And depending on the value of the weight that I go to, I am going to have on the next slide an interesting structure of the conformal multiplets. So basically, what's happening in the boost basis that's maybe interesting is okay. So I know I have the Lorentz group. I don't necessarily have the same inner products as I would in a normal 2D CFT. But one can try to find ways to, to make my Hilbert space like in and out inner product, um, basically like map that to the 2D radial quantized one. But if I just start from my boost spaces, because of the nature of the fact that I really didn't have a 2D theory, I had a 2D theory with this extra null direction that I want to get rid of, I had the power to tune my weight in some sense. So it's almost like you can always have, like if you have a question of, okay, say I have a CFT, I want to look for null states then like there's some, you'd have to basically ha happen to have the right spectrum for these like null states to exist versus I can choose my value of delta such that I'm in a multiplet that has a primary descendant. And so I have this whole tower of soft modes here that will all basically have some primary descendants. And if you go high enough, you'd also have um, like left and right primary descendants. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry. Uh, so, no, so definitely. In so if you in the boost basis, yes. I tend to get into which I so I know that yeah. like, you know if you're in this rotation and you have spin that's associated to it. Yeah. So is a singlet in the boost basis just particles that never like scatter or they just are collinear the entire time? Or? So okay, so maybe the way that I want to phrase it is as follows. Okay, so let's go to the single particle irreps that would be in Weinberg's textbook. The fact that you're in the velocity rep instead of a continuous spin rep is like the highest weight condition. And then going to the boost basis is just diagonalizing instead of d by d, or like instead of diagonalizing the energy, you're diagonalizing omega d by d omega, like you're diagonalizing the boost. So you're trading, in order to get L0 to have an eigenvalue, you're just trading energy for it, like a, a kind of a conformal energy. But the uh, condition of being um, like, say, like the helicity matches the spin to these masses guys precisely because of. Um, and the fact that those rotation generators turn into um, the same ones in the celestial sphere. And then the fact that it's a, like a highest weight type of condition comes from the ISO2 translations being zero. So there's that. So you're, what, when you're saying this question about whether things are um, I guess, I guess like the, interact, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I guess the question I'm asking is that I, I can sort of imagine what the structure yeah. of the irreps associated with um, spin is. Yeah. It, uh, I was just curious what that structure is with respect to boost. Is it corresponding to like, uh, what you have degrees of freedom associated with the boost and I guess that the associated particles changing there. Yeah, so so one th what I guess I would say is that the, maybe the cleaner starting point is instead of doing induced representation starting from like a little group that preserves exactly a null momentum, yeah. you're looking at the ones that preserve a direction of null momentum. A direction. And okay. so you can kind of do the, like the same like induced representation story okay. starting there and, I, and that roughly gets you onto here. Banerjee is a nice paper about that from 2019. Um, yeah. Is that, that's good enough? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I, no, this is, it's fine to have questions. Great, okay. So 
what I'm going to do now is I have normally a principal continuous series of weights. I have a continuous set of weights because I have continuous coordinate u. Um, and I do the Mellon transform with a certain real part of the dimension just so that it, the integral converges. But then I analytically continue the dimension, I would have a set of poles at uh, basically this tower of integer values of the weight that go more and more negative. And those conformal dimensions have primary descendants from the point of view of the SL2C, Lorentz group representation theory. And so I could posit that some uh, one of those two sets of descendants, say like in this case, the Z bar, Z bar, Z bar descendants, actually truncate at that primary descendant. Like I would expect from uh, like the, the notion of um, like the right hermeticity conditions on like going from into out state and a 2D CFD grade optimization would actually guarantee for me that those states would be null. So say I assume that truncation, it definitely works within MHV amplitudes. And then I'm basically just manipulating those collinear limits of scattering for the full uh, residue here. And they showed in this beautiful paper, like the one with Alfredo and then also Andy, uh, sorry, Himich, Alfredo, Monica, Pate, who's a, who was a BHI fellow, uh, and then Sturminger, showed that they had this cool uh, loop, register, whatever, like register the loop of like W1 plus infinity algebra coming from these collinear gravitons, so same most equal collinear gravitons. And the cute thing there is they're really using, I would say, act, treating it like it is a 2D CFT, using basically some complexified version of a radial order commutator and assuming that the primary descendants decouple. So it's cool that basically you're uh, able to get this kind of interesting, very, very rich symmetry structure compared to the whole story that started out was basically the infinite number of symmetries that you've got in the flat limit wasn't an infinity in this case. It was an infinity in the case of, okay, say I have a charge and I accelerate it. Its electric field is going to basically now be kind of pancake if it's moving at a, like a faster velocity. So there's some angle dependence. And I could try to build up an arbitrary angle dependence to the Coulomb field just by having charges that have been moving forever in different directions with different speeds. But that's just an angle dependent um, charge. So it's basically like the, a function of the two sphere. This now is basically going every order in R in some sense, or every subleading order in omega. It gives me more symmetries. So it's like another infinity of symmetries. And so you have so many symmetries, like what else? Okay, <laughs> very cool. Now, I hope, I think some people here might try to debate about whether is this part? So basically, I would say the cool thing about part of that derivation is that it got piqued the interest of a lot of people who knew post series and geography. And so the people who come from Penrose's school immediately recognize this is like the nonlinear graviton constructions, like, like you need the symmetries of self dual gravity. And I would say that for the haters are going to hate, one of the complaints you always get when you talk about these cool symmetry algebras, okay, well, like, or you're at tree level, like, how does it extend? And you either have to be very confident that, like, the point is that the, the dual theory really does have these symmetries, and you're going to start from that, um, which had some beautiful implications, like, doing the same thing with, like, uh, the black hole here story. Or you could say, okay, I hear you a little bit. Let's see if there's another way to derive it. And this is where it was really beautiful uh, work by Friedel, Honore Clariu, and um, Pranzanetti, where they are able to get the exact same symmetry algebra instead of using this kind of 2D CFT constructions, they're just sticking to your usual radiative phase space and looking at the Poisson brackets. And so I think uh, it's a nice- yeah. How is the symmetry of the central one? Central extends beyond? Uh, that's, a, that's exactly the type of question. So basically in practice, what happens is um, like, so people could use these symmetries in MHV amplitudes Right, but there's uh, the yeah. symmetry, uh, the W1 plus infinity, yeah. that's not in the self dual, that's in general. This, okay. So, it's, and, and then there is the, there are the symmetries of the self dual. No, no, so the question is whether or not you understand. So, so in practice, I can explain how it, you have, okay, so the thing is, even with the phase space for iteration, so you could be worried about, like, for instance, the assumption here that I'm truncating this thing, if you look at an MHV amplitude or NMHV amplitude, at some like n MHV order, you're going to be worried that these actually aren't zero. Like, um, like if I take a certain number of z bar derivatives, it doesn't just kill it. Um, you have to be careful. So basically, you could like some of there's some assumption going on here, which is definitely consistent with MHV correlator, and also is consistent in self dual gravity. That one has to be like slightly careful about going beyond. So, for example, if I get to the final um, kind of version of the story in terms of the phase space, what will happen is basically you have these generators for the, like the W infinity, 
coming from just built up out of um, around the like it's basically extending the single velocity gravitons, and you can build up a representation of some half of the descendants of the opposite helicity. But if you take the complex conjugates, you wouldn't have the closure in some sense. So it is. So it's it's not obvious that you like the way that we would I would think about it right now is you basically want to like organize your Hilbert space in terms of representations of like one helicity sectors W infinity symmetries rather than assume that um, there's a nice like W infinity bar and W infinity that together have a, a better algebra. Like so it's yeah. And but yeah. what is the relation between the symmetry group of the self dual sector and the symmetry group away from the is it a direct product of two copies? It's going to be more complicated because like I'm saying I could just I know I can take the 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 bracket between the W generators and W bar generators. It won't be one of the it's, it's just going to get yeah. give me the corner. <laughs> okay, so okay, so right. So the thing is, is that the symmetry, the mechanics of getting the symmetry right here is literally just looking at the collinear limits of of scattering, and it's looking at the collinear limits of the same helicity guys. Basically, if you had both helicities, the collinear limits would have a one over z pole and a one over z bar pole. The the pole that you're interested in in the one case is basically closed under like okay the o, like say o plus o plus goes to o plus. The other one is o plus o minus goes to o minus roughly. Um, so when you you're basically ignoring like the anti-holomorphic collinear singularities in, in in half of it to get the algebra, um, and it's not clear how to Combine them back together to get something that reproduces both and is new. So, yeah. Sorry, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, so, it, uh, I just, I apologize. Oh, no, no, no. This is yeah. so, yeah. so, the idea that you have the Lawrence uh, and then there, there you have. Um, you have irreducible right associated Lorentz symmetry. Yeah. And then those are associated with symmetry at the single point on the celestial sphere. Um, more like the, like say the operator at some point in the celestial sphere is creating a, a state that can be decomposed into irreps. Like, yeah, and, and those irreps are, 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 are based on the, the irreps that and the boost in the direction, of, uh, like cause, because there's a no. They all diagonalize the boost. Yeah. And then depending on the basic or the value of that boost weight, they, if you take certain descendants, you basically, like, so if you take some number of Z derivatives, it, they vanish. So that's coming from the structure of uh, these SL2C multiples of primary descendants. So that's kind of like the Witt algebra, like uh, similar story to that. Algebra. So the Witt algebra story, I would say, is like one sub algebra of this thing in the sense that, like, for instance, there's one real, like, there's multiple realizations of the Witt story. You could say um, the super rotation generators, which are basically coming from the delta equals zero guys with some shadow transformation, gives you like the centerless Virasoro. Um, and then there's also going to be a cute light transform story where it's like U moments of the stress tensor also give you like a what algebra, but that's a, I shouldn't have gone that far. So what I'm saying, one of them is basically taking one value of K and the other is taking like all values of the, the U, uh, like of, of delta in some sense, due delta, but acting on a particular object, which is not one of these soft gravitons. So, so many ways to have okay. that, that was the very bad aside. Okay. Okay, so okay, so now we're at the stage where basically this paper by Laurent and all is trying to reproduce the same symmetries that you guys have, but understand it from the point of view of how to realize it as basically a subalgebra of the, the symmetries of a free theory, right? That you could almost take it that way. So what we're doing is we're using the extrapolate dictionary, and there's one ingredient that I didn't want to spend too much time on, which is that directions of momentum space get aligned with directions on the night sky, which makes sense because if you have if you send a plane wave out with a like momentum. Where is it going to hit the next guy? It's going to hit in the direction that you hit it forth. So there's that. Or you're transforming between position and momentum basis just to get the, the value of, say, the shear at some cut on sky. And then you have uh, your Poisson brackets. Um, and your phase space between the C and C bar. It's a new derivative here to get the delta function. So this is just equivalent to like the AA dagger bracket that you're used to um, <coughs> in perturbative quantum field theory. And so as a summary of what they did, they basically set up a recursion relation to get them these sets of dimension three um, operators defined in terms of C and C bar and basically higher and higher numbers of, of those guys. 
that obey under just the ANA direct commutation relations, the exact algebra that you wanted. So in this case, there's not this restriction to the wedge, um, but they're able to reproduce the, uh, the thing underlying this delta infinity here, just what on is, phase space. What is Q? Oh, sorry. So Q, so they define it. So basically, take this as a, as a definition for a recursion. Ah, that's and a, then this, and Q, the this W is this guy. So C is the shear from here. C, I hope I have everything on the side. So C is the shear, and you could have the, you could add ZZ into C's, but it just suppressed for here. So this is like um, this is the shear, and then the shear for the opposite, like the complex conjugate of the shear, uh, those two, and effectively um, the delta equals three modes that were basically sitting along here are these higher spin generators that are constructed as basically the late U time limit of these Qs. And in the end, the point is, is that they're able to construct an object st starting from um, basically higher and higher moments of C. I didn't put the C here because I, I you know, um, that give you the right algebra. So roughly speaking, they have now for the graviton case, the, the paper was just looking at gravity at first. There's a single graviton term, a two graviton term, three graviton term, et cetera. And the tower is such that they actually obey the right algebra. So it's like just the, the Poisson brackets or, or commutation relations on the A's and A daggers give you what you'd otherwise extract from Bullmarker collinear limits. Um, I'm going to have the explicit expressions on a couple slides later, but maybe I should have put first, but I'll, I'll come back to that. So what I want to point out is that there's another statement in that paper, uh, which is that basically for them, they're really interested in the fact that these recursion relations look like equations in motion for them. And the reason why it's, it's a little bit more subtle. So basically for them, you can say that I have these higher and higher U moments. So I integrate the news and then I integrate U times the news and I integrate U squared times the news, et cetera, et cetera. And then I add in higher particle terms so that the algebra is what I want. They then can recognize that some of those guys under the equations of motion match to like the bonding mass, the angular momentum aspect and deeper and deeper kind of terms in the vial tensor near spatial infinity. And so the equations of motion basically relate these kind of moments of the, the shear along scry to um, terms that are at spatial infinity. And so it, they go deeper than the bonding mass angular momentum aspect, but in this whole story of like charge conservation and symmetries of the S matrix, the point there was that you have this antipodal matching, you're able to match data of the metric near spatial infinity coming from the past of future null infinity and the future of past null infinity. And so the equations of motion play the role of giving you an object that you can antipodally match. Without the equations of motion, you're basically constructing a representation of these symmetry algebras you get from the holomorphic collinears, limits of scattering on the radiative phase space. So basically just some sets of free oscillators with given spins. So the next part of my talk is going to basically be saying, okay, for the BMS subalgebra, which is the one where we have all this, the first start of the soft symmetry worn identity story, you're able to realize basically that the, that the thing, that recursion relation you can stop uh, at uh, for like the lowest values of spin, just a linear term and a quadratic term. And then you have the splitting between a soft and a hard piece. And similarly, splitting in the hard piece between a gravitational part and a matter part. So for example, uh, the leading soft graviton couples say to the anic operator, and this would be the anic matter term and then the shear inclusive anic is roughly. Um, so the kind of premise of this paper with the gray is like, let's take exactly that same construction and add matter to this full tower. And see what's happening. So, uh, what is Q again in the previous slide? I mean, yeah. Okay. Is, is there so, are some words about. Uh, yeah, I feel, okay. I feel like I'm this... no, in the previous slide. Yeah. So, I feel a little bad that I. Operator. Little Q is not big Q, and this is where yeah, yeah, I feel a little bad. Yeah, I don't know what that what is. Okay. Multi particle operator. So, if you look at just this construction, when I go up in S, I'm adding a term with like sheer times this. So the, the thing that I didn't write here is that the first term in the recursion is basically like the, the new derivative of the news. Uh -huh. And so then every time I go up, uh, unless there's a special value of S here, I am basically adding in another graviton. Uh -huh. So like, like I get more and more graviton mm -hmm. terms as I go higher in spin. So I will, I think on a couple of slides, I'll write so, it down. So that's the definition of capital W there. So I'd say the definition of capital W is that's this. The definition. Yeah. And where was the definition of Q out of that? Yeah, what is so, Q? Uh, so, yeah, Q so, Q Q Q. so this is the, sorry. So let me just say that the only thing I'm missing here, which I should have had on my side, is the initial value of QS for like negative two is the right. shear. So 
there's, so I, I didn't write down the seed of the recursion. That's my problem. Then this is a recursion to go up to higher QS, and there's a slight renormalization procedure to take this limit and define WS. So I hit a renormalization procedure in the seed, but this is what you're using to define it. Um, so that's a faux pas in mind. And this is actual relation, how do, yeah. they, how do they derive it from the equations of motion? Or? In some sense. So I think so they guess it could encode it, all, all, all orders, right? So historically, yes, exactly. So it goes up to any spin. Historically, I think they guessed it from the equations of motion because uh, Daniele and, uh, and Laurent were basically examining just the, um, like say this is like the TU term, the TUZ, like say GUU, GUZ, and then GZZ, these are right terms in the equations of motion. And they found that basically, if these Qs were like the bonding mass or the angular momentum aspect, then there's this kind of nice um, structure where like, so for instance, I think the first term is like the complexified, some complexification of the bonding mass that has like the dual mass, like you have like for a 12 knot solution and the mass combined and, and like with the right plus or minus I. So okay. the equations of motion look like this if these Qs are basically components of the vial tensor in your spatial infinity. Or like, or in your some kind of view, but like they're looking but at. But that's it only getting all there. It's some, I, it somehow should encode all orders in the asymptotic expansion, right? Yeah. So basically, because, this shouldn't. Uh, Subleting curves. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure. So, so, why so, is so, this, so this is derived from the full nonlinear. So, so it. Equation. So basically, this is like taking Einstein's equations at like leading order in R. So stripping off every power in R. Probably. So I, okay, I don't have enough questions to write this down explicitly, but if we said that one of the charges was like the bonding mass, this is like the constraint equation in, in GR that you see with like, do you have bonding mass equals? Yeah, but like that's the, only the leading order, right? Sure, but that's the first term, right. one of this one value of S. Yeah. And so then they do the work of going to the next value, like every relating, order. not, they don't show every order, but they show a couple orders and it goes ah, deeper. So it's, an, it's, a, it's a guess for all orders? I would say that that's a guess, but for me, I don't care. Because I'm not, I, what I don't care about, I don't care about the input much right now. I just care about realizing the symmetries on phase space. So you give me like some smearings of gravitons on scry that obey the algebra that I want, I'm happy. Right? That's the. Well, this guess would probably be exact in something like self dual gravity. And I think they that they're literally... working a little bit on that. So yeah. the, but the, sorry, so the thing is, is the, to, the equation of motion getting you to this guess is good if you then want to match in and out and say that there's actual symmetry your scattering and that's important but for me i just want the symmetries like i want the algebra of the operators yeah can i focus me a little bit about this is yeah. that as you know to to compute zero mode commutators yes their their edge modes and and their commutators are not they don't follow from from the bulk commutators right you have to do a more careful analysis that's the famous factor of two national yeah numbers. but i think those They're factors sort of, yeah so my picture of it was that so you, somehow you're getting higher and higher orders, and um, it higher and higher orders than what we are. Yeah. And I thought my picture, which it, I thought was true, but I um, never planned it or, or yeah, yeah. It, that somehow there would be more um, degrees of freedom at every order than one over R. Yeah, exactly. And, and so why is it that the and, the, and I thought that the soft theorems told us what their commutators were implicitly. But and, and are you now saying that those commutators just follow from, from the leading commutators? Or so what I want to I thought they were independent degrees of freedom. I want to say two things. I 100% agree with you that when you're looking, so if you did like Sufferman and Graham gauge, and this is something that Luca uh, has been like helping me like understand a bit better too. Um, if you're doing Feynman Graham gauge and you want to basically it's like solve for the free degrees of freedom, you have your leading sphere metric and you have whatever one over rho to the d, depending on the dimension. Uh, and those are free functions of, of u and the, the sorry the time coordinate, and then the 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 what would be end up coming the Cecil sphere when you go flat. Um, and then if you want reflective boundary conditions, you kill one of the two. So. In the case when you go flat, the structure of the recursion going deeper and deeper into R is such that you have right the, the news, and then you have a bunch of one over R terms at one fix you cut, right? So it's exactly what you're saying, where the new data is like the um, subleading guys in one over R. 
So I don't know if this is what they say exactly in that paper, but my impression was that equations of motion are roughly relating those subleading powers in R to um, like, like basically the word identity should be matching those two. And it seems that somehow it's consistent. There's some condition that's at least consistent with the equations of motion that would be relating those new moments to the bonding mass is what it roughly seems like from just the structure of what they're saying. Because for me, like for me, like literally the only thing I care about is that this gives me higher and higher multiparticle terms that'll be the right algebra. And the linear term is consistent with the higher and higher U moments of, of the field. But when you, you look at those- explicit matching condition. I, I think it might, I mean, the yeah, problem is that that, that combination of everything. You want to say that? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Just no. make a comment. Yeah. Um, uh, about the structure of differential of motion as a yeah. the, the asymptotic shear is a initial delta value problem it depends on u mm -hmm. it's not a, a constraint function of u and out time but as you go uh, farther and farther into the bulk there are infinitely many new term appearance but they are u independent yeah, yeah right? so that's the structure that you see here on the right hand side that it is u integral appearing so yeah. essentially what you're saying is that this equation is telling you that when you give uh, the initial shear of the problem, mm -hmm. then you can solve the u dependency of the farther and farther in the bar code. Yeah. Whereas there are there are going to be many dependent bar functions here. Right. So this is what this equation is telling you. And actually, the way maybe to make also comment about the equation of motion and the derivation of this in Einstein gravity, yeah. the way that this has been derived as a recursion was to assume symmetry. So the QS on the left hand side transform as a BMS. So that you can literally compute the phase space variation of this QS to all orders in S. And that's how you find the right hand side. So it's not indeed uh, a derivation that Einstein equations of motion will give you that, but it is a consistency with the asymptotic behavior of symmetry. So, um, so if you assume a symmetry, then the conclusion that you get the symmetry. So, I mean, no, no, you're assuming BMS and you're getting W1 plus B. That's very different. You're not assuming W1 plus B. You're assuming that BMS organizes your fields actually to all of them to expand toward the prime. It's certainly plausible, yeah. but there's only one consistent way of matching. And, and so, and then also, I think the, the, the independent data could be just kind of tweaking the integration custom here. So, like every time you're integrating up, you could imagine adding, like, okay, like, it's like shifting right. it. Um, and that doesn't affect the. The, like basically the fact that these fields are definite weights and then I think that their brackets are roughly up to a, I mean like the, like the brackets are probably constrained by the symmetry so much that like I think the factor of two issue in the flat guy comes from understanding like these kind of contributions near past and future null infinity and that saddle point approximation and for hard headed yeah. Uh, can I yeah. maybe comment? Oh, yeah, just no worries. I think maybe yeah. just the first two orders of Einstein equations are universal. They right. don't depend by Einstein gravity. You can take any asymptotically flat uh, so, uh, gravity theory yeah. that would have a universal behavior in mm -hmm. in orders, and that what gives you BMS. Right. So BMS yeah. is independent of Einstein, of the theory in the body being Einstein. It's a universal feature of asymptotically flat space times, and that's why organizing bulk fields with yeah. BMS it's a universal result, and independent so, of Einstein. And so roughly, yeah, in a sense, you said bound of condition. That's it. Well, yeah, or you can see, like, if I think if you look at the Pepper Graham story, we were like working with a like a master's student to show that like the conservation of the the whatever Brown York stress sensor is just the constraint equations, right? So it's um like leading like a one over landed. I think this is a thing yeah. happens in electron because sure, if yeah. you consider like a, just a radiating dipole or yeah. a radiating particle, you can go farther. You can go to higher orders in the one over R expansion, right? and the the, uh, the charges associated to that are going to appear with derivatives in the lean order. Yeah, and so and then you also can try derivatives with, with respect to R with derivatives with respect to U. It's, it's, it's a very universal thing. Yeah, and then also like um, if you roughly look at just like the form of like the control primary wave functions, you're going to see like the there's a sense in which you're deeper and deeper fall offs in in uh, R for the size and the dimension. And the U dependence are these higher and higher. Like, so, but, but I think Andy's asking a, a good question, which is okay, I can do all these U integrals of the, the news. It doesn't, like, I'm actually implicitly making some assumption about the integration constant when I say it's just equal to the bonding mass. Um, the equation that matters is the U derivative of the bonding mass checking it, right? So, um, 
Okay, good. But the nice thing is, is that this won't affect me too much because I'm sticking at square plus. And so for me, like, I think these are very, this is a very important question for then talking about actually using these symmetries in this formulation to talk about um, either trying to, like, I, I think there's some cool projects that like Laurent and his grad students are working on along these lines where you're really trying to say, okay, across everything so that the out state, or like in state has like zero charges or something really big. But so that's going to be very important for him, but it's less important for me just to try to get like this uh, oscillator realization. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a comment on the universality of those terms being independent of the theory. Yeah. And uh, I guess I find that very confusing because I thought that this whole structure depended on your characteristics of your theory being null. Yeah. And so, so I think he's saying, I think he said it's universal for any s flat. Yeah. And so literally, every flat is the no. flat theory, but then yeah. you have uh, null characteristics, but then your asymptotic behavior is going to be zero. I mean, it, it could be asymptotically classed by some different term. But it's not going to be, if you don't have no characteristics, I don't think you would have any of that. I think that they, when they say generic, they generate for the thing that has that structure, right? <laughs> it's a statement to point with Sop's theorem and also the subleading Sop's theorem don't, don't depend on the theory. But you can do the sub sub theory, then you what? have that you're not looking at the Pordesky gravity, then surely that's not fair. Pordesky gravity, okay. But I mean, it, I, right. to, to, to I think what she meant was if we had any kind of R squared or matter interaction. Yeah, so, local, yeah. local so as long as you don't change the structure. Any, any that 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 as long as it emit a data properties on the, a, a, a null hyperspace, that's on the ground on property on null hyperspaces. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what to happen if it yeah. dies. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like we could argue about whether we want to put it I would say it's generic to the So one could say it's generic to the structure where it's yeah, yeah. So like generic in a subclass class of things, but then it's not generic enough. But it's not it's not actually universal. Sure. Generic and instead of universal, generic to the same universal it just some fields. It's our universe probably. Okay, sorry. I don't have much dumber question. I'm just trying to understand the equation. Uh, the, the previous one, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, are the n the s is corresponding? Is it similar to the degrees of freedom for the wild scalars? If the so it it can map you can map the wild scalars into these guys. Um, roughly these are objects with different spins. So the s is literally the spin. Okay. Uh, so and have... they're all dimension three. Okay. And. Uh, if I understand, the U is a fine time. The U is a fine time, and then the charges that we want are basically pushed to uh, spatial infinity. So for us, the reason why it's nice for me is that all of my U integrals are over the full gray plus, and then I basically traded out like these are now like the values of delta, and of capturing all of the U moments of the radiation instead of there being extra U cutoff dependence. So like. Um, yes. Yeah, so the, the thing I'm trying to understand, I guess, is that if you have a static space time, yeah. like, say short shield, yeah. what happens? Should, should, does that differential equation, is it just zero or like what is it? So it, it depends if you're like literally evaluating it on C versus an operator. Um, so I guess if you've just plugged in all of the news being zero, then sure, each of these guys would roughly be zero. And then the question is when you integrate up in U, are you adding an integration constant, which would be like allowing like bonding massing and randomness, like that, which you have. Uh, and so that question only arises if I try to then relate the under like Laurent's version of the equations of motion, say that that QS is actually say bonding mass when s equals zero, right? So, so it, it, I guess it depends on like the interpretation of the equation for it depends if you do the the thing that Andy was worried about doing versus like so so what I'm saying is is that if you if you want to if you say say this is literally supposed to be classically a classical solution, I just want the value of the news and shear. Basically, the, the seed of it is going to be zero. So there's no U derivative of the news. And then I also don't have this term here. So every time I integrate up, do you want to allow an integration constant or not? Oh, uh, right. So roughly. Yeah. Yeah, we should uh, let our speaker finish. Ooh, okay. so this is fun because basically you have people who actually know what's going on and then the people who don't like are from other fields. So it's like, or, or younger people too. And it's just like, this is perfect, right? <laughs> like if I don't answer, someone actually does. Um, but I know eight questions I know I wouldn't get asked. So I love this. I'm I'm enjoying this. I hope you guys are. Okay. So um now basically the thing that I just want to point out is this kind of gravitational matter splitting that we a little bit take for granted. Um and so now I'm gonna actually write these specific down, which would have been maybe helpful a couple of slides ago. Um so basically if you want to realize the graviton matter uh kind of OPE, uh like the Holomorphic collinear singularity story, 
and then algebra that comes out of it from the radiant phase space, you're going to try to add matter terms. The linear part is going to be the same. I'm going to still say that these u moments of, of the shear are, in this case, I'm using the opposite holistic guy just for, for simplicity of matching to Laurent's paper, are these uh, single particle terms. And then you want the two particle term to basically be such that the commutation relation of the two particle term with the matter field matches the OP, the, the, the coupling of the matter field to the graviton, right? And so uh, that can actually set for you the coefficient. So basically here, all I'm doing is I'm matching the, the thing coming from the, the you know, external matter field coming out, graviton vertex, and saying I want to reproduce that holomorphic collinear singularity from the phase space bracket. So you need a term that's quadratic in the matter field so that when the matter field is another matter field. And so one can reverse engineer these quadratic terms, or similarly for the graviton case, just solve the recursion that Laurent had. But for the matter case, sorry, so for the gravity case, you can solve his recursion. For the matter case, I want to match the soft theorem. So I get a quadratic term. And then I can try to go particle number by particle number and uh, go to uh, three particle term. What do I need to add to make it so that the algebra closes up to quadratic order? And so the quadratic terms and quadratic terms give you another quadratic term. The linear term and the cubic term also give a quadratic term. And to make this algebra close, you have to engineer a cubic term. So it's kind of cute. Is that basically, so I'm kind of saying, screw this recursion relation. I'm just going to try to go up to the S equals two generator that would give the rest of the W infinity algebra. Um, know that the linear term, linear term has to be the uh, more and more subleading soft gravitons to match the fact that the thing you've inserted in the S matrix element is this like integer weight, negative integer weight uh, graviton. And then the quadratic pieces match uh, the algebra corresponding to the um, the uh, actual soft theorem, the coefficient of the soft theorem. And then the cubic term is there to make it close up to quadratic order. And then you could imagine going further and further particle number. And so basically what's kind of cute is that what happens is that when you go beyond the BMS subalgebra, basically the, the matter term needs a graviton term in order to cancel. So you don't have this nice structure of just like the soft and the hard charge where the hard charge only has matter and the soft charge uh, is a linear and graviton the hard charge can have, sorry, the hard charge can have like a quadratic graviton piece coming from like the total energy lost by like the gravitational radiation and a matter piece. For the more and more uh, subleading or higher S charges, you have terms which are like gravitons coupled to the matter fields. And so, okay, maybe this is not surprising because these objects are basically the same type of ones that you would have. If you got rid of the graviton, you'd be looking at some sort of matter theory and you'd be looking at the operator algebra of these light ray supported operators in that matter theory. That matter theory is a theory kind of living near null infinity. You might think that if it's basically asymptotically free, to what extent it's approximated by the free 40 CFT. Uh, basically, you would have thought that maybe Cordova and Chow and others who are studying these uh, light ray operator algebras and CFTs would have found something more. So this transitions me to the main part of the talk. So how, oh my God, okay. How, like, very, you guys can always leave, but I, I'm, I'm gonna keep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I, like, this is the fun part for me. So basically, okay, you have these cool people starting from 2008, Hoffman uh, Lucena, and it really actually dates back a lot further. So, so, so you don't know how many years of like being a grad student and people will be like, well, what have you done? This, that, or like, what's this use for? These anic operators, correlation functions of them that are this hard charges in our story, were used even in precision tested QCD, which is kind of surprising to me. Like, I didn't realize like going back in the day, like they were using that to actually test um, test that. Um, so conformable collider physics is trying to normally use like insights from radius CFT to compute observables in this CFT that are supposed to be relevant to particle experiments. And so they're literally looking at something that's produced from a scattering process. They prepare a slightly different state, but they have these operators at paternal infinity, just like we would for preparing our state. So the cool thing is, is this program has a lot of like nobody doubts like like well, what have you learned from these programs? Okay, you've bounded some anomaly coefficients. You've identified good observables when you're looking at say these detector operators and like near Wilson Fisher fixed brain. You've said something about modular Hamiltonians. There's a lot of cool applications that have come from like the same objects, and that's what I'm basically trying to. So these light ray operator algebras. One of the first kind of nice uh, intersections of this Drominger et al. group. And this story uh, coming from Los Maldesena was this result by Cordova and Chow in 2018, where they basically looked at just unitary 4D or in any case any D CFTs and operated to a light sheet and try to see if they could generally show 
that those matter stress tensor moments basically obeyed the BMS algebra, and they did. So roughly speaking, they just have a unitary 40 CFT and operators of a light sheet give you BMS. So that would make sense in the story before where we have Q soft and Q hard. If you really have a factorized Hilbert space where the soft part and the hard part can back separately, then the soft part and the hard part should both obey the same algebra. And they're just giving me the matter sector there. And so what's kind of cute is from the celestial geography perspective, basically all of these other generalizations of the anic operator are also um, celestial primaries. So they have definite weights. And um, so basically if anybody says, well, why are you looking at a blue space? Like they're looking at a blue spaces too. They just don't care. <laughs> yeah, and this is like, it's kind of cute. When you have, you talk to them, they're like, why are you looking at a blue spaces? And it's very like, just because it's a generalization of the anic. But in practice, the reason I guess is, is not so surprising that, Okay, so when you have a primary that's at spatial infinity, that conformal frame uh, is such that like the action of like say being a primary, so K annihilates the operator at the origin, is that translations annihilate the operator at spatial infinity. So any primary that's sitting at I zero, whether or not it's a light transform of, of so, so it's actually extended along the sky, those guys are gonna be trans annihilated by translation. So there's zero energy. Um, and then the only thing left over if you're looking at the Poincaré subgroup that preserves spatial, uh, preserves uh, the conformal boundary, is going to be Lorenz, so maybe that's why they land on these, these boost eigenstates. And they even land on like shadow transforms like we have. Um, and then the other thing is that if you're looking at the zero energy sector, that should be somehow closed. And so that's why they're kind of starting from anic and these generalizations that are also zero energy, et cetera. So there's a kind of reason, reverse engineered reason for why they look the same thing. That's a question. Not. We should keep it okay. at the end, yeah. <laughs> okay. So basically, there's a hell of a lot of cool, really, really cool people who are looking at the same operators as us. But the reason why we really never encounter them so much is because these guys are like the quadratic terms that would appear like higher multi particle states in the celestial OPEs. And the reason why they wouldn't care about ours is because uh, they're only looking at one value of the conformal dimension, which should annihilate the vacuum. So it's kind of like this, um, not Romeo and Juliet, it's like basically the, the tragedy in the sense that like these objects are almost zero for our out states. And so we're the contact terms, and so we save them to zero. And our first objects are zero in their context because they're either not looking at gravity or they're looking at only one value of the formal dimension for which it is zero. So it's just like, that's why there's been a disconnect. But basically, the library operators that are featured in the conformal collider literature are celestial primaries, corresponding 40 CFT correlators, probably the conformally soft matter sector of the 2D celestial CFT. That's just true based on kinematics. And in particular, you can go back to, whether it's Bellin's papers or uh, Camilla Sena, other people's different definitions of things. And these matter charges that appear in the celestial story are uh, contain contain the same term. So roughly speaking, these higher and higher U moments of the stress tensor are appearing in this W infinity story. And so the on the one hand, you can just say, okay, well, all of the story of like what Laurent is building up are extensions of this notion of these detector operators or conformal collider operators. But in practice, the way it's interesting is it's kind of twofold. So you're studying the same operators in different states. Normally they're looking at inclusive processes. So they wanted like IR finite observables and it ties into our story because we're looking at, like say there's this like features of the soft factorization coming from the asymptotic symmetries. So they're not unrelated there. Um, but they're looking at the same correlation functions just basically time folding back. Um, and if we want to really consider scattering, we don't want to restrict ourselves to basically some finite number of particles well separated. So the anic is like zero away from those insertions. We would also want to be carrying with the same states. And so these approaches are quite complementary. So basically, anybody who gives a shit about not competing with level computations, like, I mean, obviously sometimes we, we have, but basically that community is starting from like, like, like um, higher loop order than normally we have. So we can just take their results and say, yes. Similarly, and honestly, curiously enough, they actually run into issues with, like there's so many states with definite, say boost and spin, like including these like shadows and whatnot, that they don't really know like how they're supposed to, like they don't understand why there's this funny mixing that they've seen like this detector operator paper. So I would hope that because we have a, a good combination of operators coming from these celestial symmetries, we may be able to give them a reason for why some of their like beyond BMS organized the way that they do or not in these uh, detector operator stories of like uh, some stuff in, and, and smoke and hope. So, and in both stories, the question of whether these operators even exist is important because you could be worried like, okay, so just looking from the oscillator algebra, you should have in this Bellin story, basically these U moments of the stress tensor should be a, a Witt algebra. But if you look at it in actual correlation function, something breaks down. And for us, we care about these operators being well-defined because it's related to this question of whether or not we can really talk about 
um, the integer weight basis um, has been a complete basis in some sense uh, in our celestial story. So those are very tied together. And I wanted to point out, so like the point of this talk was to make a very concrete contact with something coming from a very different and independently developed subfield where we're studying the same objects. And we want to emphasize that really, even if anybody gives you shit that you're just looking at kinematics, like symmetries are really, really powerful. And a lot of people are looking at the same kinematics. And so this is basically ripe for the picking as far as basically celestial taking over. And so going back to Sima Tuck, we have things coming from the Zirkin and Cubit, also Moon and Malvasena, uh, intrinsically bootstrap these complex spin light ray operators and amplitudes like these soft limits of scattering, all colliding to celestial morphy. And that is my talk. <laughs> Long, I mean, like, I talk fast, and so I actually went long on my <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina, for an excellent yeah. talk. Uh, we have time for one question, if it's very urgent. Otherwise, we can uh, reconvene for lunch. I think there were enough questions. Yes. So we should just have lunch for yeah. with our speaker and thank her again. Hmm. So, uh, about your comments and uh, right.